All right, so today I'm going to be discussing inflammatory bowel disease um, in small animals, so I'm going to focus on dogs and cats. So what is IBD? Um, IBD is a chronic inf inflammation and irritation of the gastrointestinal tract. Um, chronic being that it occurs very suddenly, um, and the liver and pancreas can also be affected. These can be affected first, um, where your dog or cat may, ha may start with a pancreatitis or hepatitis, and then um, through a uh, bacteria, bacterial infection, this can travel to the gastrointestinal tract. Um, either that or the bacteria could start in the gastrointestinal tract and then um, cause a pancreatitis or a hepatitis. The inflammatory cells that um, are involved in this inflammatory reaction are, whoa, are neutrophils, lymphocytes, macrophages, eosinophils, and plasma cells. You should remember these from our, um, our immunology. immunology lesson. Um, the chain of occurrences that happens in IBD, um, after the cause, which I will look at the causes here in a little bit, um, after the cause, the inflammatory cells will enter the lining of the stomach or GI tract, and this will cause the GI tract to thicken. Um, the thickening hinders the animal's ability to absorb nutrients from the food, um, and then if this goes untreated, then it can lead to dehydration, um, malnutrition, and then eventually death if it's not caught. Does anyone need more time? Or? I'll just add one thing. Uh, one of the previous slides had acute. Now, it might have been, um, no, it was chronic. Chronic. It, was mm -hmm. it might have a sudden onset, but a chronic in the deep meaning means always present. You know, and I think that's mm -hmm. yeah. always present. And sometimes it might have a sudden onset, but chronic usually means it's always there in the long term. Well, yeah, and I'll get to that here in a little bit. And of course, this is being recorded. They can go tonight and mm -hmm. look at the image and get it up. So I think you're going to get um, And so here is a little bit of the histology of um, the intestinal lining. These are the uh, villi in the intestinal tract. Um, and these are what absorbs nutrients, as you can see here. Um, all of these little stained dots um, are the inflammatory cells. There's definitely a lot more in these as there than in this picture here. Um, and also the surface area is decreased in these villi. And the surface area is what you need to um, be able to absorb more nutrients. And so the villi have less surface area, and then less surface area um, means less contact with the food, and then so you're absorbing less nutrients. Here's a picture. Um, huh. So here's a picture of the feline intestinal tract. Um, here you can see uh, the cat with IBD, and then here is without. Um, there's definitely a lot less space in here for food to come through, um, and it's very raised and inflamed. And on the left is the normal healthy food. Mm -hmm. So the different forms um, and the different names that IBD is given, um, if the main inflammation is in the stomach, it is called a gastritis. Um, if the main inflammation occurs in the small intestine, it's called an enteritis. Uh, if it occurs in the large intestine or the colon, it's called, which the large intestine is also called the colon, it's called colitis. And then the most common type is um, the lymphocytic plasmacytic enteritis. So, um, that occurs in the small intestine and the main inflammatory cells that are um, heading there are uh, lymphocytes and plasma cells. This is a picture um, of a rat <coughs> GI tract, um, mainly focusing on the colon. Uh, here you can tell this is definitely a lot more inflamed. Uh, this has colitis all throughout. Um, here, 
right in this section is the um, colitis in this track, but down here, this is the normal size that the colon would be for the rat. So now I'm going to discuss some of the causes. Um, there's a lot of gray area here. Um, there's not much research that's been done on the causes, so and it's very hard to tell um, from one case what was the main cause of it. Um, so most causes are just identified as idiopathic or um, not really knowing of a cause. Um, if you um, change to a different protein in your animal's diet, that can cause um, an allergic type response, which will cause IBD. Um, if there is bacteria or a parasite that is in the intestines, um, that can cause IBD. And there is a lot of speculation that genetics play a part in it, but not, not much research has been done, so you can't conclude that. Um, but breeds that are prone to IBD include soft-coated wheat and terriers, Sharpays, and German Shepherds. Uh, some of the symptoms that occur uh, when your dog or cat has IBD, um, you could see vomiting, or with a cat, you could see more than usual hairballs, um, along with diarrhea, which will lead to dehydration, and so you can see symptoms of dehydration, um, such as excessive skin tinting, um, wherein you p if you pick up their skin, it won't, uh, it won't just flatten out and go back to its normal position quickly, it'll kind of stay in that tinted up position where you pulled it for a while before it eventually settles back down into its normal position. Um, you could see rapid weight loss, and then in most cases, there'll be a loss of appetite. Um, some cases you could see um, a big increase in appetite just due to they're not getting the nutrients they need, and so they will be eating more. Um, again, that can, that can vary based on the different cases. <laughs> Farting a lot. <laughs> Excessive gas. <laughs> uh, and now diagnostic tests that you can do to um, conclude if it is IBD. Um, you can take a fecal exam. This will help you see if there's any parasites or bacteria. Um, this is not always conclusive. Um, you can do a blood work panel and measure the B12 and folate levels. Um, these will be low in a dog or cat with IBD. Um, you can do an X-ray or X-ray or abdominal ultrasound. Um, then again, these can also be misleading because um, it's hard to tell from an ultrasound or an X-ray if this is IBD or if it is a if it is lymphoma. Um, which is cancer. Um, and then you can also take an intestinal or gastric biopsy, which is where you take a little bit of the tissue um, from the intestines or the stomach and look at that and try and identify, um, identify if you're seeing those inflammatory cells. Um, this can be done endoscopically or surgically. Um, both of these are a lot more invasive than the fecal exam blood work or abdominal ultrasounds. So these are more of the, um, the measures you would take uh, after you've done these if all else fails. Here I just have a picture detailing um, how, the bop how the biopsy is taken endoscopically. Um, this is where they go um, through the colon and um, through the intestines, and then they um, grab a bit of the intestines here and basically pinch off this little bit of tissue. And here's another type of biopsy. This is a punch biopsy. 
Um, you use this little tool and you just punch out a small section of tissue uh, to be analyzed and looked at. Um, again, this is a lot more invasive than the other measures. Treatment, um, you're mainly treating the symptoms of IBD. Um, if, if you do identify that it is IBD, um, there's no cure, especially for the um, idiopathic types where you don't know what is causing it. Um, the first step that you could take is um, doing a diet change to a different protein or to a high fiber diet. Um, and if it is the food that is causing that, then uh, the symptoms should get better, or go away. Um, if it's not, then you just have to try your next option. Um, and usually if you do these, this food treatment, it involves a food trial. So six to 12 weeks of only being on that one food, no treats, um, nothing different from that because that can um, hinder the food trials results. Um, more treatment, uh, deworming. If you see anything in the fecal flow, um, you can also do you can also deworm even if you don't necessarily see anything in the fecal float um, because that can be misleading as parasites aren't always shedding eggs or oocytes. Um, you can do metronidazole, you can give metronidazole, which is an antibiotic and also an anti-inflammatory. The only downside to metronidazole is that it, um, it can cause a loss of appetite, which in a dog or cat that already has a loss of appetite, uh, you don't, and you need them to eat more, um, that can sometimes be a big downside. Um, you can give them a B12 injection, especially because they're not absorbing those necessary B vitamins through their intestines. Um, you can give corticosteroids, which is another anti-inflammatory. And also, um, along with the food, you can give a probiotic. Um, probiotics help to um, increase the number of good bacteria that are in the intestines. Um, and that can just help sometimes with um, helping them absorb more nutrients from their food. Here are just some of the um, different diets that I have seen used. Um, you have here the GI moderate calorie, um, this selected protein, which I believe uh, this specific one here um, contains rabbit. Um, this selected protein for dogs, um, it's KO. Um, I know this one is kangaroo. Um, and then this fiber response here for cats. And then um, here's just Hill's prescription GI food. Um, just different bland foods with different proteins which you may not be seeing in um, uh, non-prescription dog foods. Um, and also you can, there is uh, over-the-counter foods for stomach sensitivities. But these are just some of the prescription foods that I know of. And I just wanted to kind of leave off on a high note. Um, this is my cat that we have. Um, we got her, I think, about two months ago. Um, and when we got her, um, the people that had her before didn't want her because she was vomiting a lot all throughout their house, um, having really bad diarrhea. And no matter what they tried, they just couldn't, couldn't do anything for her. Um, so we decided to take her. Um, when she came to us, she was very thin, as you can see here, um, right here in her paralumbar region. It's very sunken in, um, and her tail is very thin. Um, we tried feeding her the same food that my other cats were on, which is um, sensitive skin sensitive stomach by Purina, um, and that didn't work. Um, her diarrhea started getting worse. Um, and so eventually I took her to the vet, and this is her there. Um, while she was there, um, I collected a fecal sample, and um, we gave her a first dose of dewormer. We gave her Panicure. Um, and then um, I elected not to do a blood test just because um, I wanted to do kind of let's try the food first and try the less expensive methods before we... Um, elevate to those more expensive methods because um, she's just going to be a barn cat. So I, I didn't want to spend excessive amounts of money on her. It sounds bad, but you have to think of this. Now, what's her name? Because you're saying her, but what, she must have a name. 
Her name is Mouse. 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 <laughs> because we want her to catch mice. <laughs> so we named her Mouse. Um, and, and while we were there, the fecal float came back, no parasites seen. Um, but we did continue the, um, and did a full treatment of Panicure just in case. Um, because again, those oocytes may not be seen in the fecal flow unless you do multiple um, in consecutive weeks. Um, and then I also switched her back, I switched her to um, this GI fiber response. Um, we didn't do the dry food, we did the wet food because again, we wanted to um, replenish that water that she was um, losing with all the diarrhea and the wet food has a lot more um, water content than the dry food does. Um, and we did that for, we've done that for about four weeks or so. And since then, um, her diarrhea has been significantly reduced. Um, and one thing we had noticed before was that her, um, her anus was very swollen and red to the point of if you would try and lift up her tail, she would turn around and try to bite you. Um, and we couldn't get a temperature on her when I took her into the vet's office. Um, but since then, um, there's no redness or anything like that. So her diarrhea is significantly reduced. Um, her anus is a lot less inflamed and she's just doing a lot better and happier overall. But she has not started to gain too much weight back yet. Um, it, with cats, I've noticed it's very hard to get them to put on weight. <laughs> and it's a very long process, but we're just continuing to do that food and not changing it. And it's, so far, it's working. And there are my resources.